Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we begin by actually transferring this huge vessel over to Mars. Well, I mean, obviously starting it's on, it on its way. Right now it's 10 hours ahead of its um, burn time, but we will start the ion engine portion of this burn as much as we can do with the ion engines before lighting the engines on the tugs, right? Because uh, they will provide the methane and oxygen burn and not entirely sure how long they're going to take. So we have throttle down for that. And then if we activate their engines. And I guess turn off the xenon engines because that's oh uh, wrong things. Those are the backward facing ones. We definitely don't want to use those. OK. So uh, the tugs will take 30 minutes to do uh, a full burn, and we only need half of that, so uh, call it about 16, 17 minutes maybe. Okay, RCS to turn, lots of RCS go on here because of all the tugs. Uh, turning to the node. And then of course we'll have other launches. So uh, somebody asked about commsats. I have, I want to make a custom model for the commsat pack. Instead of stacking them vertically, I sort of want to have them in a horizontal, more horizontally positioned. I'll, I'll show you once I make the model. I haven't made the model in Blender yet. But I had an idea for that. And uh, that'll be in the next episode if I get it done in time. As far as launching all these missions to Mars, this is sort of similar to what I did in the career mode in uh, Beyond History when I launched a Mars mission. My first uh, crewed Mars mission in that series. My only crewed Mars mission in that series. Um, yeah, we had 11 launches for that Mars window. And um, five of them were backups for... Uh, basically, the core mission only had five elements. There was one, uh, one bit of the mission that was optional. And then there were backups for all the... Everything but the crew module. So, yeah... This is not unusual, and even if I had a budget, I expect I would do it. And actually, the rockets we're using are much smaller than the ones I used in that series. Uh, our largest rocket in that series, I think, was 5,000 tons. Okay, we really don't need to do all this. Okay, now SAS. Alright, that, that seems fine. Okay, now we've got that on. So we need to time warp. That is still affecting our orbit. Very good. It's not got to do a whole lot, to be honest, but that's to be expected. Sure wish the reaction wheel was a little bit more vigorous. Okay, here we go for the main burn. Ignition. The way the RCS is puffing is sort of interesting. Let me turn that off. Uh, the gimbal, there's a little bit of gimbal on the tug engines and that should be enough to handle it. Though you can see it's maxing out pitch and yaw for some reason. Well, it looks like we need the RCS. Well, I sort of wish I had put the time warp while burning module on these tugs, because this is taking a while, but we appear to be reasonably on time. We're a little bit late, but not a whole lot. So our plot shouldn't be too bad. Besides the fact that over here our orbit is relatively flat, so shouldn't have deviated too much. As long as we get a moon periapsis about the same as that, we should be basically in the same place. Well, this will be the whole inclination thing. We're actually above the moon there. So that better be the case. Maybe I should make some Hydrolox tugs. The only trouble with that is, you know, hydrogen is takes up a lot of space, but... Could be benefits. That's the nice thing about this whole idea is that you can upgrade it quite a lot, right? I mean, there are a lot of things that can be redone and upgraded and improved upon. We can add more xenon. We could use a completely different fuel if we wanted to, if we wanted to use argon or something else. And the lander could be completely reconfigured. Because it's not a monolithic thing, 
Um, yeah, you could sort of mix and match ideas, and each I expect that each one of our Mars transfer vehicles, because we'll basically have a fleet of them, will end up being quite different from each other. Which gets to the point that once we have a few, we will need to name them. So present your proposed naming conventions in the comments below. Also, I decided to record with a different instance of OBS Studio with a somewhat different audio um, setup. So if it sounds a little bit better, please say so. If it sounds worse, also say so. I can easily switch back to the other way if it turns out that this way doesn't sound as good or sounds better or if it sounds better we can stick to it mostly concerned about the sound I don't think the visual will be any different okay we are beginning to get our moon encounter there and it's getting closer and closer well it seems like we'll go below the indicated periapsis maybe it'll go above that afterwards go past. I'll probably let the ion engines take care of the last bit uh, on account of the fact that we're approaching periapsis so uh, prograde burn will be marginally more efficient as we get over there anyway. Okay. So shutting down the tugs and just the ions. Yeah, we could have left more to the ions, to be honest. Look at that. Okay, let's shut the ions down. That node. And let's see what we really have to do out in interplanetary space now. Do we have a Mars encounter? No, of course. Well, no, we no, we, we have an approach, but we need to edit our node out there to fix it up. Hopefully it'll cost less, not more. Yes, good. No problem with it costing less. Inclination's off though. Okay, so more or less as planned. Okay, and let me just check right now what the capture mount would be. Not that we could possibly do it immediately. This is gonna be complicated. Like I said, this is only the second time I've done a uh, Mars trip with ion engines or any substantial trip with ion engines. So it's all it's all a test, 2700 there, because it's just not the same way as executing normal maneuver nodes. So, yeah, it's like learning everything all over again. It's all quite fresh, so mistakes will be made. That's why we're not putting Kerbals on this one. Mainly, mainly it's just executing the maneuvers and seeing if we can get there with the fuel that we have. That's why we don't have Kerbals. Otherwise, I would have gladly sent Kerbals on this. Um, I don't mind risking Kerbals here and there. Okay, but uh, let's pass by the moon before ignoring this again. Well off probably depends on how we're oriented towards the sun or away from the sun. The tanks are sort of all over the place though. I don't... unless we're pointing tail at the sun. I guess we could point tail at the sun. The back solar panels will do the trick. So we are in Lunar SOI now. Uh, we're pointing nose at the sun. That should still shield the main tank with all the fuel in. I don't know where we're getting boil off. Oh, it doesn't show any boil off there. Maybe it could just hold this orientation would be fine. Anyway, where is the moon? There's the moon. So as we pass on by... Rare to actually pass by the moon while trying to get to Mars or some other planet, but here we are. Well, for now, uh, I've oriented all the other probes, so we don't seem to be getting any power warnings, so that's good, because if it kept giving me power warnings every five minutes, that would be really irritating. Okay, departing Lunar SOI soon. And... Well, it's three more days till Earth escape. I'll leave it be for now. Yep, I'll just uh, let it get out there. I'll add its maneuver node. 
Only in 24 days, incidentally. I wonder if that's really the best location for it. And I'll think about that after we do some more launches. But we do have many more launches, so let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to launch in this episode is a tug. We are just going to launch one of our tugs, our, the larger form factor tug, the 2.5 meter diameter ones. And um, yeah, it's got locked fuel and it's got a heat shield and hopefully we will be able to capture it around Mars and have it ready, mostly fully fueled, to do its business of tugging things around as necessary, right? Um, it is daylight, that is good. Our uh, pad structure is not fully sized, I need to tweak scale it up a bit, but we'll ignore that for now. Throttle up, SAS on, we've got a super heavy, and ignition. And launch. So yeah, uh, the tug also, of course, has uh, solar panels, docking ports, and the like. But uh, most important thing is the heat shield and the piston to extend the heat shield. I'll show you once the once the fairings are off. So that's a little bit uh, quirky. We'll see how that works out for us. And um, other than that, we plan to launch some other... Uh, we've got... Uh, Space Station Module, our first Mars Station Module. Technically, the Mars Transfer Vehicle also acts like a space station, but uh, we might as well start constructing something a little bit more serious. And I wanted to send out an ISRU unit, and uh, that will actually be a Blue Origin Blue Moon, uh, the same as we used on the Moon. I wanted to see how the boil-off works with the hydrogen, so that's a side issue on that. So for the USI modules, I've been working on them. I've added Kerbalism features. Uh, I made a Kerbalism configuration that adjusts the converters. I don't know if I've adjusted them properly. I just copied what was intact life support. One of the problems is uh, the converters are only um, doing the whole food, water, and oxygen thing instead of supplies. You know, USI does supplies normally, but uh, we wanted to do food, water, and oxygen, but it only does food, water, and oxygen when there's tack life support, there is no tack life support. So it didn't know to do food, water, and oxygen. So I made a new configuration that copied the tack life support configuration. And hopefully we've got the modules doing food, water, and oxygen. We'll see. I also added uh, exercise machines to some of the modules where I thought that that was appropriate. You know, that sort of thing. There's a lot to work out. Okay, ignition of the core. And separation of the boosters. Startle up. Reusability is, of course, another thing we aren't doing, but... You know. I want to keep things simple. This is more about what we're actually sending to Mars than how it gets there. If you want to imagine all this being launched on a Falcon Heavy, that's fine by me. <laughs> Uh, yep. Okay, fairing set. So here's our tug. And the heat shield is centrally mounted here because of course it has to cover the whole thing when it inflates. And we've got a extendatron stackable piston thing. And that's on a docking port. Hopefully the docking port can let go of it. We'll see. I, I want to get rid of the piston. Obviously the heat shield can, you know, jettison itself, but wanted to knock off the piston, otherwise we'll have to like send a curl out to grab the piston off of the docking port or something. But, yep, so that should cover this thing. Uh, the reason we needed the piston is because otherwise it'd be colliding with it and parts of the tug would be clipping on it. And if we just like put some sort of cylinder there instead of the piston, then the heat shield would not fit in the fairing. So. That is why it's like the way it is. We had to have a piston. It was not an option. Oh, of course, I did put full MLI layers on the tug. Otherwise, it wouldn't make it with a whole lot of fuel. Hope we'll see how much fuel it makes it with, with 100 MLI layers. Hopefully a lot. 
Okay, separation and ignition. Nozzle extension, check. Okay, everything looks good. And shut down. 231 by 186. Let us plot for Mars. Okay, I ended up a little bit late here, but the fuel is settled. Ignition. And we're off. All this going on, I want to test the extension that happens properly. Oh, it's not happening properly by the look of it. What is it doing? Did I put this on wrong? I think I put this on wrong. Or is it the other way around? Nope. Okay, well, so much for the piston. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be working at all. It'll probably flip into the tug. I don't know what kind of temperature. The tug can deal with some temperature. That's probably a bit cheaty. It's not really supposed to. Uh, oh, didn't seem to get an encounter. What happened? Oh, it's like to keep burning. Good thing we have a lot of ignitions. Okay. Now we've got a thing. We'll probably need a mid-course adjustment. So let me quickly get a mid-course adjustment in. Seems like this ascending node is the best place and I'll be in 30 days shortly after Mars transfer vehicle. Well, I say after. The Mars Transfer Vehicle could do quite a while, uh, take quite a while to do that burn. Okay, this isn't working. Right, that's not the right place. Halfway it is. That's the other traditional place. Yep, much better. Maybe I should move the Mars Transfer Vehicle's plot to halfway instead of at the node. Okay, for now that'll do. And let's make sure it's recharging as it gets out into daylight. Oh! The piston extended while I was in time. What? Okay. Let me... Let me not use pistons. Pistons seem a bit glitchy. Yeah. That... That didn't happen with the old pistons. <laughs> uh, the old, uh... Not white-colored infernal robotics parts. I don't need to revert, it's fine. Let's just go back to Space Center. Okay, well I tried to get the legacy infernal robotics parts in, but it doesn't seem like they're showing up, so we'll have to hold off on trying to launch the tug until I figure something out with that. So instead, what I'm going to do is launch our station module, so the first bit of our potential Mars station. It's a USI Pioneer module with the same Mars Mission Control module that we have on the Mars Transfer Vehicle. Anyway, I'll show you once we get the fairings off, throttle up, SAS is on. We're a little bit off on relative inclination because I'm launching immediately after the previous launch, but here we go. Ignition. And launch. Still, we've got plenty of time to figure out what we want to do about all sorts of different aspects of the mission. I haven't even touched the whole Phobos and Deimos thing yet, but probably I'll do something similar to what we did with uh, in my Beyond History series. And have a multi-purpose little go-around vehicle. Probably still using the Lynx cabin, but we won't need land- well, we will need landing legs. We won't need some of the other stuff like we won't need two engines, for instance, or parachutes, or anything like that. Okay, core ignition. Throttle down. And separation. And throttle up. And we continue. We've actually got quite a lot of time to wap waps this. Let's flatten out here. And let's dump the fairings. 
So again, it's a USI colonization module. In stock, these would be 2.5 meters in diameter. Here, 4 meters. There's also a 6 meter diameter one. And we've got the heat shield at the bottom here, inflatable, of course. And uh, we've got the Mars Mission Control module up there. And of course, this will eventually be a station, so it's good to have the reaction wheel in there and the thrusters and everything. It should the thrusters should be powerful enough to do whatever we need to do with this, as far as corrections are concerned. And of course, uh, the NASA docking system at both ends. This one over here too. And solar panels. Oh, and also radiators. I actually put radiators. And uh, Commutron 88-88. The one thing that I was thinking about putting on but didn't was an inventory unit. Might have wanted that, but you might wait until a subsequent launch. Maybe even the next window. We'll see. Let me just make sure this is not being depleted. Let me lock this for now. This has electric charge, yeah? Yeah. This, uh, because it has solar panels on it, those got converted to apparently a trivial amount of megajoules. I don't know. I don't understand how that all works. But uh, at least we've got food, water, and oxygen built in. I added that uh, recently. I discovered that, well, of course, I had been relying on TAC life support to automatically put food, water, and Actually, I think USI has a configuration where it'll automatically put food, water, and oxygen in the modules as long as TAC life support is around. And... I used to just rely on that on my RO configurations for USI, but since we're using Kerbalism and not TAC life support, I've manually put in the food, water, and oxygen now. And you can see full shielding as well. Uh, it's only about um, 28 days, uh, 4 weeks worth for, uh, I think it's 4 Kerbals. 4 Kerbals, 4 weeks. So obviously we'd need more logistics support. If we wanted to have them hang out for longer, this is not a logistics module. Well, I mean, it says logistics modules, but that means something different in USI than the way I mean it. Still not totally sure what machinery does in this module. I've used machinery before in other modules, but this one I don't know. It does have a habitat uh, scrubber, humidity controller, pressure control. No exercise equipment. I don't know what Czech Colony Rewards is. That's something completely different. Camera rapidly going, focusing up here because that's where all the mass is. Now. Well, Delta V wise, we seem to be very good. And still not drawing from that. Uh, I mean, this is much less fuel than like the tug carries, so. We can't do a whole lot with this. Just minor maneuvers. Let's get the antennae out before I forget, huh? Oh, uh, we need to shut down soon. Oh, I didn't control that properly. Okay, well, we'll cut it off there. Focused on other things. Well, let's get all the stuff out. Kerbalism is going to have to deal with the power draw for the actual Kerbals. That's a separate issue from the power draw from the module itself and its avionics and such. So I'm assuming those are two different things. As far as the radiators, that was sort of a bonus. They're a pretty heavy bonus, mind you. These two little tiny radiators, 0.27 tons, which is heavy in context. Pretty darn heavy radiators. I'm not too sure radiators are supposed to be that heavy. I don't know. Seems rather heavy. I mean, the solar panels are very light by comparison, so I don't know. Anyway, we're carrying them even though we, strictly speaking, don't need them. Maybe there'll be some reason down the road. Maybe. I might need to strengthen that reaction wheel a bit. I mean, even for this, which is, well, it is 61 tons. It's not like that reaction wheel does a whole lot. Okay, I'll go ahead and ignite. Okay, here we go again. We are on escape. Needless to say, most of this stuff we want in, like, all the same orbit. 
Okay, right there will be fine for now. And we want a mid-course adjustment, of course. And we'll fine-tune that once we get a little bit closer, but that looks about right, and 3 meters per second is fine. So, we get to add that alarm. Why do I feel like I'm missing a... I'll check on that. Anyway, um... Yep, let's get this into daylight and see that everything else is fine. We'll leave the stage with it. Okay, yep, yeah, it's certainly recharging. I'm gonna rotate it a little bit to optimize that you know, the other way. Get a better recharge rate, and then I'll also have persistent rotation hold it. Once it figures itself out, it is on its way. That's a MKS Tundra Pioneer Plus Logistics module. And we'll see how it works out for us. For the last launch of this video, I'm going to go with a ISRU unit, identical to the one that we landed on the moon that used ore. And so, in fact, I haven't even put parachutes on it. We'll see if it can do a propulsive landing on Mars. And it does, of course, have a heat shield. But other than that, uh, minimal adjustments still on a Sujita Heavy. So I'll just launch it manually. Throttles up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. I also have not put any more solar panels. We'll see how they do. The main question is how the hydrogen holds up on the long trip. It's 10 months. Well, actually 11 months. So it's a very long trip to Mars might be that we just don't have any hydrogen left by then, we'll see. Of course we've put full MLI layers again. Nice to be able to launch during daylight. So it encourages me to do more launches. Okay, booster set. And throttle up. Bearing separation. So it is as you see it. Uh, just the same module with <laughs> with a heat shield, inflatable heat shield right at the top of it. I thought about just putting a normal heat shield. Those are actually lighter once you dump the ablator. You only need 10% of the ablator, or less even, for Mars. But I decided to go with the inflatable one to better cover it, because um, the large heat shield that we could fit in the fairing still wasn't very convincing. So, um, yeah, we've got this one and we'll jettison it when appropriate, but no parachutes, so we're relying on the fuel here to actually land it. That's a little wrinkle. This arrangement does allow us to use the engine down here, the BE-7, if we need to for corrections and such. One downside is it does have to sort of turn around, I suppose. Hmm. Well, we'll get to those details later. Pulsive landing's gotta be easier, right? Sure. Okay, separation and ignition and nozzle extension. Oh, I shouldn't have turned it right when the stage was about to end. Okay, everything looks good. And we definitely have enough to transfer over to Mars. No problems. Okay, I'm about to make orbit. And that's good enough. 232 by 156. Alright. Okay, let's get the solar panels out. While we wait for the burn. And I suppose, well, let's keep the radiators in for now. No pressing need for that. Oh, comms. Hmm. I don't know what six gigameters actually ends up being 
in the grand scheme of things when we take into control the tracking station, it might be enough. I wonder if I had the foresight to give it enough range for Mars rather than just the moon. Well, it's definitely more than we need for the moon, but I don't know. Uh, I haven't worked out the math on that. So right now Mars is 119.8 gigameters, but again, the tracking station determines how far 6 gigameters really stretches. Oh, we've lost communication. Well, that's not great. Uh, well, we're back. All right, we'll do it here. We're do we'll do it here. It's fine. I'm sure it won't make much of a difference. <laughs> We've got some to do the correction. We've got 700 meters per second. Hopefully, it won't take that much to correct for the gap in the timing. We may arrive, I want to say earlier, maybe later, I don't know. Than the other missions, I mean. And we're off. Oh, 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 no, no, shut off, shut off! Oh god. I thralled down, but uh, I guess I wasn't clicked into the window or something? I don't know. Alright, well, we're gonna have to make a correction anyway. And, I mean, an immediate one. Yeah, right around there-ish. Hopefully we'll still have communication. But uh, let's see what kind of correction we can do with 561 meters per second to get close. I guess because we're hitting at the node there, the descending node, that it couldn't possibly be any faster anyway. Nope, this is not what I wanted. Where's Mars? Might not even need a mid-course correction after doing this. Okay, yep, we will do that burn pretty much instantaneously. I'll have to be quick on the trigger on that. Okay, keeping the throttle low but still fairly quick. Okay. Okay, it looks like a correction in Mars SOI will do the trick. And so it depends. I don't really think we need, that's pretty darn good right there, but we'll need something as far as that periapsis is concerned. It's too touchy right now to fix that. We need to dip into the atmosphere. So that's what we'll do and add that alarm. Okay, so unfortunately we had a failure in this episode. But uh, we've got two, well, we did three transfers successfully, the Mars transfer vehicle itself, and then the Pioneer Station module, and then this ISR test unit. This is probably going to fail. It's mainly a hydrogen storage test, boil-off test, and we'll see how that goes. But, uh, yep, I'll leave it here. I have some parts to make, too. Uh, the ComSat parts I need to actually make in Blender, for instance. So I'll get on with that. And with this, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.